second session of the second day. So um, it's it's great to have you on board. Kroiso i uil sinia dai tidawi. It's the Ideas Festival, and we're so glad that um, we're, we're, we're up and running. Uh, as people may or may not know, uh, this was due to be a real event. Um, it was uh, devised by a, a group of people from uh, St. David's, from Solva, uh, from Cardiff, um, over 18 months ago now, and the aim was to have this as a real live uh, festival. Uh, but uh, events overtook us, uh, and after a small pilot event uh, last year, uh, we resolved to go ahead with this digital event. So the I Festival of Ideas is, is up and flying. Uh, last night we had over 100 people looking at uh, our Paul Mason um, session, uh, people from all over the world. My my friend Lloyd in America was watching. So hello, Lloyd. I hope you, you set your alarm for 5 a.m. ready to watch Sarah. Uh, and then just before I go into my introduction for Sarah, I would like to remind you that um, uh, we are completely voluntary. Uh, and although a digital event is relatively cheap to put on, we have incurred costs. And certainly our main objective is to run this live next year. Uh, which will involve costs. So if you'd be ever so generous and um, and put uh, put your finger on the donate button on on our on our website, that would really help us to uh, to take the momentum from this digital event into a real event um, next year. So enough of that. Now let's come to the real the real bit that I've been looking forward to on this uh, in, in this festival ideas uh, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah Bynum. She's a conservationist, uh, an entomologist. Um, she developed uh, uh, an interest in dung beetles very early in her career and that interest led her to a doctorate at Oxford. It led her to become the vice president of the Royal Entomological uh, Society. Uh, she returned to Wales, to um, to St. David's, to, to, uh, to her roots. She bought the, the family farm and she turned it into uh, a visit att attraction, which is one of the best in the UK. And that's not my opinion. That was uh, the opinion who, of the panel who voted it one of the best uh, startups in, I think, 2015 or something, when the gallery, the... the the insect, uh, you can see all the insects there. Uh, it's a garden, it's a gallery, it's a brilliant restaurant where Andy, her husband, will cook amazing food for you when you go there. And one of those courses on the menu will be insect-based, uh, so you can really push the cul culinary uh, boundaries there. Um, so uh, I'd like now to just um, uh, hand over to, to Sarah. Um, uh, you, you've got the uh, ability to pose questions um, uh, on the Q&A button, and it'd be best if you did, did that. That's easier for us to manage. Sarah will see the questions, and so will I. Um, we'll aim to finish by about 10 to 12, something like that, so you can uh, have a bit of lunch. Um, uh, so, Sarah, tell us all about the future of farming. Well, hello everybody and welcome to the talk. I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. Um, do post in the questions at any time if you can't. Um, I'm going to uh, screen share a presentation as well so you don't have to look at my face and our manic office the whole time. Um, and the idea of the, the talk today is I, I want to give a bit of an overview just from, from our perspective, my perspective here, um, about the issues that, that are being faced um, to feed a growing population at the moment. Um, and, and then just use a couple of case studies, really, at looking at new methods of farming for the future, based upon, again upon our experience here. Um, and then how we can do that alongside looking after wildlife. So uh, it's not one thing, it's not feeding humans or looking after wildlife. Uh, and, and then we'll sum up at the end. Um, I think it will be easier for me, time-wise, if we 
um, probably I'll answer the questions at the end largely. Um, so I'll do my best to finish a good sort of 10 minutes before the 10 to um, you may have to, to fire questions at me to make me do that. Um, but I, I will do my absolute best. And then we can have a, a bit of a conversation um, towards the end. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, she says, let's go on to that one. And I'm just going to put the slideshow up in a second. It's a slightly old computer, so it takes a minute to do anything. OK, can everybody see the slideshow? Ivy, do you want to nod if you can see it? Yes, yes, absolutely. Brilliant. <coughs> so um, I'm today speaking on behalf of, um, of the Bug Farm that I set up, as well as Bug Farm Foods, um, which is a food business, and Grub Kitchen, which is my husband Andy's um, restaurant. So a little overview about, I, I, I imagine I, a few of you watching know about the Bug Farm, um, probably uh, some friends out there as well. So I apologize for, for, for repeating anything, but I thought if I give a bit of an introduction about where I've come from for this um, and then then kind of moving on from there. So I'm a farmer's daughter from St. David's um, born and brought up here with the most extraordinary upbringing of, of giving animals the best life possible when they're on a farm um, and also looking after wildlife at the same time. And I, I've got to mention here before the day that is tomorrow um, that I have been hugely inspired by two extraordinary women in my life um my mum and my gran both of whom are, are uh, no longer with us um and i would not be the person that i am today and doing what i am today without these people who who taught me um to value the world around me and to question the world around me and i think that's such a huge impo important part of life is questioning and not just accepting the status quo um, and not just because we've always done something in one way that we should always do that in the future. Um, and also that that isn't about disrespecting how things were done in the past. If we're moving, if we're innovating, it's not disrespectful of how other things are are done. Um, so just had to put that in there as well. Um, like I say, loved animals. And then so as a farmer's daughter, uh, went off to study biology um, in Oxford University. Um, and became fascinated in insects, the, the small creatures at the base of every food chain. Um, and, and I've had some fantastic experiences, um, both, both during university and then, and then afterwards during my PhD. And, and after that, when I've been lucky to, to work as a, a television presenter at times uh, around the world um, and studying, studying insects and other invertebrates and having some pretty awesome adventures at the same time. So, so why insects? I mean, we, we know of a, a million species of insect already um, that we've discovered. And who knows, there may be five, 10 million species that we haven't even discovered yet that are out there doing their thing, but very sadly going extinct often before we even know that they're there. Um, say they're at the base of every food chain, they're responsible for pollinating, well, them and other animals responsible for pollinating up to 75% of our food plants and 90% of wild plants. And I think this is, this is you know, uh, uh, the issue at the moment, so I'll flip back, it, is that they're providing these ecosystem services, services that we as humans and the rest of the animals on the planet rely on, undetected. Um, and we're currently in the middle of a biodiversity mass extinction. So recent reports suggest that we may cause the extinction of over 40% of all our insect species in the next few decades. So well within our own lifetimes, if we carry on the way we are. Um, and, and that's terrifying. Personally, you know, the, the thought that we could be responsible for this, and we know about it, we know we're doing it, if we don't change um, how we behave as humans, then it's, it's, it's unforgivable, um, really. Um, you know, we've lost 97% of our wildflower meadows that are some of the most important wildlife habitats just since the 1930s. So yes, there's doom and gloom, but also what I'd like this, this talk to show is that it isn't all doom and gloom. There's some great work going on out there and we have the potential to reverse these declines. And it's not just insects, it's across wildlife generally, we're seeing these declines. Um, and we've, we've got such potential to make a difference now but we won't have that potential if we leave it much longer. Um, and so that's why we, we all have to act now. 
And that's really, I suppose, why I started up the bug farm. So the bug farm was always going to, to be a research centre about researching how we could produce food efficiently whilst looking at wildlife at the same time. Um, so it started up, as you say, on, on, on the, um, the family farm that we bought back in 2013 here in St David's. Um, and then we realised then that, that it's all very well having workshops and just carrying out academic research. But we're not really going to deliver change unless we talk to a wider audience. We don't want to just preach to the converted. And um, so we, we started up the bug farm as a visitor attraction. Um, and we've got a tropical bug zoo, museum, farm trails, wildlife walks. Um, at, and we have lots of, of visitors in right through from, from school groups uh, and, and families to, to adult visitors as well. Um, we very much wanted the bug farm not just to be for kids. Um, and the whole idea is really just to say, look how extraordinary these creatures are. So you're going to get people in through the door. A lot of people going, what the heck am I doing at a bug farm? I hate bugs. They just scurry around and oh, they get in my hair and yuck, don't like them. Wasps sting me and spiders scuttle across my room. Um, we want those people to come to the bug farm. So on a, a holiday to St. David, oh, what should we do? Oh, we've heard about this bug farm. Let's go and have a go, or have a look. And then we want people to go, whoa, they are cool. And then from that saying, actually, they're really important as well. Um, so this is our, our tropical bug zoo. Um, and when we also run as a research centre and a, a working farm as well. So we, we farm 100 acres here, then we graze another 40 acres of National Trust land. And then I farm um, another 60 acres in partnership with my father as well. But this is the, the main bug farm site. So we're expanding bit by bit each year um, as, as we can. Um, and getting people to be able to get out and explore more of the farm and more of the wildlife habitat that we're creating. Because at the moment, we're um, in a, a big transformation at the bug farm, transforming from, um, from a farm to a wildlife reserve. So it's, it's an exciting time for us. And then, of course, here's Grub Kitchen, um, as you said, Ivor, where, where you can enjoy good food, sustainable food, uh, locally produced food with or without insect ingredients. Um, and a big part of, of, of that with insect ingredients is you don't necessarily need to see them. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the future. This is actually um, uh, an insect and plant protein called Vexo that we've innovated. That's a Scotch egg made from, um, made from Vexo. But you can see them every now and then if you want a bit of fun too. So that's a kind of a, a bit of an intro about who we are and, and what we do here, a very brief overview. Um, but the, the, today's really about how, how do we feed a growing human population without destroying the environment at the same time? So, you know, the big issue, obviously, there are by 2050 going to be 10 billion people or so ish on planet Earth. Um, and we just can't keep producing food and consuming and wasting food the way we do. Um, you know, by 2050, we're going to need 42% more cropland, 120% more water, 70% more food. Um, and, and particularly if we keep eating, for example, meat at the way we do today. So we're, we're due to double our meat consumption by 2050 if we keep eating it as we do today. And yet to meet current environmental standards, we need to halve the current emissions from our livestock. So, you know, if we just keep following the status quo and intensifying and intensifying, then obviously that, that's just not possible. Um, I, I want to say as well here that I, we're very, very keen here at the bug farm that it is not about eat insects or eat meat. Um, and it, it's also not about saying that the way we're farming um, it is, is inherently wrong. It's looking at alternatives that can sit alongside our agriculture to, um, to, to help us eat and farm more sustainably. So yeah, if we do carry on eating the way we, um, we are at the moment, we're gonna need three planets um, to, to grow that food. And obviously we don't have three planets. Uh, and this, as I said before, comes alongside the fact that, um, that we're destroying our wildlife at an unprecedented rate, you know, um, one in seven species is at risk of extinction in the most recent state of nature report. I mean, that's, it's just terrifying. And so, I mean, we, I guess we've got a number of ways, haven't we, to feed a growing population. So, so the first way really we could go is we could intensify. So intensive farming is where, as, as you'll, you'll all know, is where we try and produce more food from the same amount of space. And that largely involves more chemical inputs, um, so more inorganic fertilizers, more pesticides, more herbicides. 
and we can't share that land with nature because we simply can't afford to waste that space or waste the food that that wildlife would eat um so we need to kill them so it's them or us it's a it's sort of a warfare between between nature and humans you know we're we as humans are one species and i always find it find it terrifying that we prioritize humans over everything and we are one of the world species um and we just we can't carry up this on and the other thing is from an animal welfare point of view um <clears throat> excuse me that if we're looking to simply intensify production animals have to be able to be farmed in smaller spaces and, and an inherent issue is the animal species that we've chosen to farm are animals that in the wild would wander over vast distances you know cows would live in family groups that would you know cows can live for for 20 years or so they'd have these intricate hierarchical hierarchies um, and wander over a known territory, a large known territory, keeping them pressed together into feedlots to feed our expanding population it, it, it is, is a, a huge impact on their welfare. Same with, with chicken production, with, with, with so much production. And what I'm not talking about here is, is what really what we see in Pembrokeshire. You know, we, we don't see this in Pembrokeshire and so it's quite easy to become quite blasé and say well you know I, I, the, the meat I eat comes from from grass-fed animals um so it's fine to carry on eating it well that's that is all very well yes we, should, we need to support our local farmers but the problem is, is it's not all about local issues it's about global issues and the more meat if we eat meat in every single meal then we are contributing to there being a need to actually produce more meat whereas if we could just cut down the amount that we eat and support if you choose to eat meat um support meat that's produced in a more sustainable way then it makes these this sort of intensification less economical um so that's one obviously there are forms of sustainable intensification and that's a big kind of buzz buzz saying at the moment um where we actually look at just doing what we're doing more efficiently but making sure that that is sustainable as well and obviously that makes sense if there are ways that we can produce more food from the same land area but that's not having a detrimental impact on wildlife um and on the climate um then then that's that's important and obviously you can see this sort of intensification is is um it, it it takes large machinery and at the you know machinery is getting bigger and bigger here in in our farm a lot of the new machines from the contractors they won't fit into our fields and they won't get through the gates because they're just made for these big fields where all the the biodiversity corridors all the hedgerows have been knocked down to make space for them to be more efficient and um, so that's that's number one obviously option number two um would be that we just keep clearing more land um to produce more food for humans and you know that's that's happening at the moment as i'm sure we've already discussed is it's vast swathes of rainforest and and well the, this is the fact that we've lost 97 percent of our wildflower meadows is because we've been we've been clearing food to um to intensify um food product uh, sorry clearing uh, wildlife habitat to intensify food production so obviously this isn't a sustainable um, way to go. We need to preserve our existing wild space because there's not much of it left. So I guess option C or option number three um, would be to actually look at changing the way we produce food in many ways um, and changing the way we eat. So we would look at producing food more sustainably. Um, so, so working out what of our farming systems at the moment are sustainable. Um, and then what are these new technologies, new ways of producing food uh, in, in a way that can produce food efficiently without compromising on the climate, biodiversity and animal welfare. And it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, hard, it's a hard one. Um, but that's where we think insect farming can come in. Um, as well as obviously eating more vegetables, uh, locally sourced vegetables and, and, and grains as well. So, you know, meat eating, massive grey area. A lot of people don't want to talk about it because they don't want to, uh, to, to kind of to tread on toes. And we, I will talk about it and I have done because, it, you know, inherently cows and other animals eat plants. If you whip the middle guy out of the food chain it's much more energy efficient because you lose a huge amount of energy every time you add a step in the food chain and i totally appreciate um you know that this isn't the case you can't grow vegetables and wheat in certain areas um and, and other grains but if we go back here you know we we generally like i say 
um, need to reduce meat consumption, particularly intensively farmed meat consumption, so that we can actually champion our local farmers. And, you know, it's totally up to us, isn't it, as individuals, whether, we, whether we're happy to kill a vertebrate animal for ourselves to eat. Um, that's a, that's a, a, a totally separate question, really, um, which I won't go into um, more here, but, but it is, it's, it's part of. So, but the same goes for, for, um, for arable and vegetable production as well. This intensification of farming, it's not just about eat meat or have a vegan diet. If you, if you choose to have a vegan diet, you still need to question where your food comes from. Um, because a lot of intensively farmed uh, protein from uh, from plants can can be highly unsustainable and take huge amounts of chemical inputs um, to produce. So I think we need to appreciate in the media, especially, um, and in our conversations with each other, where it can become very heated and very polarised, that it's not black and white. There is this massive grey area in the middle, and we need to appreciate that it is not one versus the other, and um, that we've got some people championing um, sustainable local meat and other people championing a vegan diet. And actually what we're, we're doing is we, we want the same thing. We want to be able to eat more sustainably and we need to come together um, as do farmers and conservationists and, and, and work towards um, the same goal. And obviously the, the, big, the big issue is the fact that we waste a third of the food we eat. You know, if we didn't waste as much food as we do, then we would be able to feed the people on the planet at the moment. Um, so, so we need alongside slightly changing our food systems to obviously waste waste less. So I'm just going to look at insect farming um, as a case study, as a different type of food system for the future. Um, so eating insects, known as entomophagy, um, it's slightly new to us here in the West. Um, we find it a little bit strange, uh, but two billion people around the world are eating insects regularly and on purpose <laughs> um, as part of their diet in 80% of the world's country. So, so we are the odd ones out. Um, well, we're not actually, because we're already eating insects. So we already eat insects in, in other foods, so especially in grains, um, where it's just too much work to remove every little bit of insect um, from, from the food we're eating. So we're all eating the weight of a packet of biscuits of insects in our other food each year anyway. And you can, uh, it's, the FSA allows 60 fragments of insect in each 100 gram bar of chocolate. Um, so, so we're doing it anyway. Um, but, but we believe that, that insects can be farmed in a, in a very efficient way um, as, as a, a new diversification option really as well um, across the world and the industry is growing um, steadily and um, the, the, the main issue is, is human perception of it so that's what we're working on but you can see in, in terms of producing protein so insects are about similar protein to beef and um, so that's why they're often compared to beef uh, it is because the protein content is is very similar. So to, to produce a kilogram of each protein, you can see that um, the insect at the top has a much, much lower water and feed requirement um, than, than our other, other livestock. And the exciting thing is that insects can feed on side streams of food that we produce already. So they, they're very, very efficient in converting low value feed into food or protein for us. So they'll eat the husks of, um, of grains, the stalks of vegetables, peelings of vegetables, the things that are either wasted or are seen as a low value product as well. Um, and they, they reduce they um, produce hardly any greenhouse gases. That's the great thing with insects. We've just done a, a school's presentation. As we say, insects don't burp and they don't fart. Um, so the, the that's another benefit for, for, for insect farming. It's, it can be um, very climate friendly farming as well, especially if you recycle the heat energy within an insect farm itself. So one way that we often kind of talk about this is if you create a beef burger and a bug burger, um, what are the inputs in terms of land area, feed and water for each? So any idea how much water is required to produce just one beef burger? So I'm, as I've said, I'm not going to take questions. And as I'm screen sharing, I can't see any answers here anyway. Um, so and then compared to a bug burger, so I'm just going to say so one beef burger, an intense for intensively farmed beef can take about 3000. I've got to remember this 3250 litres of water. That's like 60 bathtubs for one burger. Um, a bug burger with the same amount of protein takes half a litre of water. 
Um, and then if you look at the feed, the land area, greenhouse gas emissions as well, um, you can see that this is actually a really, could be a really sustainable way to eat. Um, and they're packed full of, of all other goodness, all nine essential amino acids, um, all other kind of nutrients that you would get from an animal based product, because of course, insects are animals. Um, but what's great about insect farming is the insect species that we farm behave very differently to the current animals we farm. Um, insects like mealworms here are thigmatactic, which means they choose to be close together. So if you're looking to intensify a farmed animal and not have an effect on their welfare, you want to farm a species that likes to be close to its friends and insects are. So if you scattered 100 mealworms across a, um, a room overnight and then pop back the next morning, they would all be piled up on top of each other in the corner. So they choose to be close together. And that for me, who you know is an animal lover, animal welfare is, is key, uh, is so important. And they can be killed uh, very effectively by cooling down um, and then freezing them. So they just shut their bodies down as they would in response to cold weather. Um, and then you keep them at that cold temperature and they simply don't wake up again. Um, so you don't have to take your insects on a, a stressful journey to a slaughterhouse um, to kill them. I think that's also really, really important. So they can exhibit the five freedoms of animal welfare in an intensively farmed situation. And when I say intensive, I don't mean any chemical inputs. I just mean that you can have a lot of them in a small space. Um, and you can also farm insects vertically. So these are trays of, um, I think these, these are mealworms. Um, crickets are a bit similar, but they're a bit deeper, the trays. Uh, and so the potential of farming insects in indoor areas across the globe vertically, um, where they're feeding on side streams of other food production in, uh, industries is, is, is very exciting. And so again, this is Andy and I in the Netherlands um, exploring different types of cricket farming. Um, and this guy has been pioneering um, his, his cricket farming in, in the Netherlands um, to, to reduce any stress on the insects as well. And as I said, I think that the key, you know, the key here is that insects can be farmed very efficiently. They can be farmed in high welfare farms. Um, with low inputs, but the key is changing how we perceive them. So this is something that, that Andy and I have been, have been working on. I appreciate I've got not a huge amount of time left, about 15 minutes left. And so I'm just going to go through a, a few ways of how we've been trying to change perceptions of insects as food. And then I'll whiz back to, to biodiversity on farms. Um, so this is my hubby. And I was very, very lucky to, to marry a chef um, because I'm a really, really, really rubbish cook. Um, so Andy and I set up Bug Farm Foods in 2017 because um, only a certain number of people can actually get here to Grub Kitchen and the Bug Farm, see what we're doing, look at our insect farming exhibits, have a meal in Grub Kitchen. Um, we wanted to be able to actually kind of get two people. So Bug Farm Foods is food research, so it's edible insect food research manufacturing um and wholesale and distribution at the moment as well um so this is our r&d center that we built in the farm um which was was um built in in part of a project with welsh government and innovate uk um and i'll talk a little bit more about that now but this is our our kind of this is where where all the magic happens um because at the end of the day i don't think here in the uk people are ready to see whole insects on their food like that I mean, it's fun. People come to the bug farm and come to Grub Kitchen and want to see whole insects. But would you scatter whole locusts and mealworms on your food at home? Um, I don't think so yet. Uh, so we started off with a treat gift product um, that is easy to eat. So we've uh, developed a range of cookies and biscuits made with insects. Um, so there's around 20 crickets in each cookie. Um, and I think about 140 buffalo insects, which are uh, small mealworms, lesser mealworms in each of those biscuits, but you don't see them because they're ground up into a powder. Um, and the idea is, is that you get bought this as a gift, you try it, you go, oh, it tastes like a good normal cookie, tick. But obviously cookies aren't healthy. Um, so the next stage, uh, we do sell whole insects and, and insect powders for cooking at home as well. And that's, that's kind of nice for people to be able to try. Um, but, we wanted to really harness the goodness from insects. So we developed a product called Vexo. So the VE is vegetables and the XO uh, is exoskeleton from an insect. So it's we're basically bringing insects and plants together. And the word Vexo means to shake up. So in a way to shake up the food industry. 
And VEXO was, was developed, um, like I say, in partnership with Welsh Government and Innovate UK to target childhood obesity. This is not VEXO, by the way, I should <laughs> say that, um, to target childhood obesity in Wales. Um, and we wanted to look at um, particular high fat or high sugar, high salt foods um, and, and look at alternatives. So we looked at highly processed, uh, intensive, cheap meat. Uh, as a way to look at alternative alternative for, and that's what Vexo now um, is an alternative. So it's a it's a insect and plant protein mince um, that can then be used in dishes, for example, like the um, the Vexo bolognese here, burgers, um, and we developed it very specifically uh, that it's very high in important nutrients, uh, especially for growing humans um, and, and targeting where the, the gaps were at the moment in, in children's and teenagers' nutrition. So that's just comparing Vexo bolognese in green uh, to a standard meat bolognese in yellow. Uh, and it's great, kids loved it. And, and that's, I think, where we've been focusing on now is, is looking at, at children who are more open-minded. I think we're quite open-minded as children, and then we've got the kind of the 20, 30 year olds who are very environmentally conscious um, and who want to try something new. But I think as soon as we get into our 40s, 50s, 60s, we're more set in our ways. And so we found that kind of age group is more difficult to crack. As soon as you're past 70s and 80s, again, it seems that people become more open minded, maybe because in childhood you would have eaten more unusual foods you would have eaten offal perhaps I know my auntie Terry when she was a hundred was quite happy to chew into any form of edible insect whole or not no issue whatsoever because she was used to eating things that were um that were a bit more unusual maybe so if you want to know more about the work with Vexo um have a look on our um, the Bug Farm website or the Bug Farm Foods website and these are some of the um, academic articles and then more public press articles that have been written um, about um, Vexo and the research that we've done with that as well but I won't go into that in more detail now because I appreciate we don't have a massive amount of time. So really that, that hopefully was just a, an example of a a different type of food system that fits alongside current food systems. It's complementary and it's delivering innovation from Wales. Um, and alongside that, looking at how we change consumer attitudes uh, and, and kind of at a policy level as well to, to farm and, and, and feed people more efficiently. So obviously insect farming isn't the only way. There's lots of fantastic innovations going on at the moment. Um, but like I say, I, I don't have that long, so I'm going to I'm going to leave that bit there. So if we do look at slightly changing the way that we farm and farming more efficiently, farming different types of food, then it means that we can leave space for wildlife on our farms. Um, and I just want to use kind of what we're doing here as a bit of a case study um, just for the next how long? Yeah, just for the next kind of five, 10 minutes um, of probably 10 um of how we can look after biodiversity um on our farms themselves so i mean here in pembrokeshire um it's a very green land uh it looks wonderfully rich you know we we love our green fields uh in pembrokeshire but unfortunately a lot of our green fields are actually almost wildlife deserts so this is ryegrass um and it's a a very common agricultural grass that's sown it's quick growing um High sugar makes animals grow pretty quickly, but involves uh, quite a lot of uh, input. So a lot of, um, of fertilizer or, or manure or um, slurry to be spread on it to make it grow. Um, and it's a monoculture at the end of the day, it's one species. And if you went and looked in a ryegrass field, despite looking green, it's not green in the sense of the word as being environmentally green. Um, so I think that's that's one big issue. You know, we, we're, we're often told, oh, make sure you eat grass fed beef. Um, grass fed beef could come from farms where their animals are grazing ryegrass, where it's not benefiting biodiversity. So I think that's where pasture fed livestock comes in, that there's, there's more um, regulations there. But I think we need to change our food stamps as well to be able to for consumers to be able to support more sustainable farming because at the moment most people don't know that you don't know that you're looking at a green field it's actually not biodiverse um, at all so this is kind of one one big issue that we're we're working on because again oops let me just go back here we go um this is biodiverse 
so so these these are the wildflower meadows that we've got rid of 97 percent of since the 1930s um largely because they would have been cut for hay um well either grazed or, or or cut for hay um with our changing climate we have smaller weather windows where we can make hay because you need a good week or so of like strong summer sunshine when you cut the grass and then turn the hay to dry it um, and we're not having that kind of um, the, the, that, that weather at the moment to, to allow us to do that year on year and then with the invent you know plastics being invented so it's much easier to cut grass wrap it in plastic straight away and it pickles it into haylage or silage um, you don't need to wait for the drying time to just cut it maybe turn it once and then bale it and wrap it um, which then has its its own impact as well, but and and that works with ryegrass. So you can get more silage cuts a year. You can do an you know one straight away before anything flowers in April time. Um, so you can raise that that meadow or that that kind of field to the ground. Then do it again a few months later. Um, and we don't have these these biodiverse meadows where you know insects they they appear in 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 kind of you know they come out of hibernation or diapause in in April May time, and there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing for them because the, the fields that would normally grow up are, are, have been mown. Um, our hedgerows are often cut within an inch of their lives uh, to look tidy. Um, and so I think we just have to change, like say, how, how, we, how we view the environment and what is green, um, what, what actually is environmentally green and just be prepared to, to, to have things that don't look like a billiard table, um, that, that that isn't what we want. We want, I suppose, what would a lot of people would say is a bit of a mess. Um, I personally don't think that, but then I, I get it in a way. Like, you know, when I've mown the paths here at the bug farm, I go, oh, that does look nice and tidy. And I hate myself for thinking that. Um, but that's how we've all been brought up to feel. So so we're doing a lot here at the bug farm of reinstating wildflower meadows um, and further afield as well, managing them as wildflower meadows um, for our cows. So you probably gathered now that I really love animals. We don't eat our cows. And um, this is a big, a big change for, um, for, for my father, particularly when, um, when we've kind of been taken over uh, or taking over the management of the cows. And um, so our cows are here primarily as a conservation grazing herd and as our friends. So this is Barney with his earmuffs on. He's my pet calf. Um, and so they manage our wildflower meadows for us. So this is something I've been really interested in from an academic point of view is what is the value of cows as conservation grazers, if they're living a natural life in a herd and free roaming over large areas, what economic and biodiversity value do they have? So we've got we've got a number of projects looking at that at the moment. Um, if their end value is not simply meat or milk, you know, um, so so that's something that I find interesting because we need our our animals to graze if if we're wanting wildflower meadows to, to manage them to stop scrub totally taking over and grasses smothering out the flowers. Um, so let me just look at time wise. Yep, just a couple of minutes. So we're where the blue star is here. So that's the bug farm. Um, and to the north of us is the Dowrog Common. Um, and then to the south of us is the St David's Airfield Heaths. And they're part of the North West Pembrokeshire Commons Special Area of Conservation. And that's an internationally important area of wildlife habitat and yet they're massively fragmented so there are big gaps between the different areas of these these important areas of wildlife habitat and so what we're doing at the bug farm is creating a wildlife corridor so that wildlife can move um, between these two areas and then we're looking at developing that even further um, off-site as well throughout the whole of the um, northwest Pembrokeshire commons working with a number of partners so hopefully um, we took this photo I think last week um, Andy got a drone. It's very exciting. Um, and so this is this is the farm, and you can see the field sort of to the middle right um, is our current habitat corridor. So that it's that one field um, that animals and wildlife can really use to move through to go to the Dowrell Common that's in front of us. Um, and you can just see that that's the big issue. You could I, mean, I think that photograph really does show um, the fragmentation of wildlife habitat and what we need to do about it. And we've been now working with a number of partners um, to try and, like I say, develop what we do here is a, a case study of, of wildlife conservation. Um, and then these are our different areas of land and we're now trying to join them all up um, and link them to the common land so that wildlife on the peninsula has, um, has 
place to go. Um, and the project we're working on at the moment is a sustainable management scheme project with Welsh Government. Um, so I don't know if any of you know the marsh fritillary butterfly. Um, it lives in little meta populations, so linked populations. Uh, and it was, there was a meta population on the St David's Peninsula and it was last recorded in just 2013. Um, but the butterfly is now presumed extinct in the St David's area because of lack of habitat. It feeds on this devil's bit scabious plant and the devil's bit scabious plant needs cattle or pony grazing so it doesn't get smothered out. So we've got a project now where we're, we're planting 10,000 devil's bit scabious plants across the site and seeding. We've got a couple of academic research projects on, on, um, on the go as well um, to try to bring the marsh fertility back to the St David's Peninsula. Um, so it's a really exciting project. Um, at the moment and I'll say when I'm here actually that we're as part of this project we're going to be doing a training day um it'll probably be online um in in the next few weeks uh where we're looking for volunteers to come and help us um monitor the habitat so that we can actually look at where the potential habitat is across the whole of the St David's Peninsula and then see how that could be managed um and also how to go out looking for the marsh artillery butterfly so if you're interested in learning more about the project um, or potentially volunteering any time for helping us with surveys and um, then please do get in touch um the uh, e either here um via that email address or via our website and i say the, the bigger picture really is about creating more florally diverse habitat and then bringing all these rare species back and these are a number of, of rare and common species that we find now here at the bug farm um, We've also been trying to link and the future projects will link with the local community as well um, and, and seeing how we can how we can infuse the local community um, to, to especially manage gardens um, and, and community areas in a more biodiverse uh, wildlife friendly way. So this is a project that we did. If you Google the um, St David's Pollinator Trail, you'll come to the main uh, trail page and it's a, a trail around St David's. Uh, showcasing pollinator friendly habitat and also it was part of um, a scheme that we got where uh, St David's is now um, Wales's first bee, uh, bee friendly city so it's yeah been really exciting so I think I'm I'm running slightly out of time Ivor do you want me to speak for another couple of minutes or do you want me to come to a, a quick end? Uh, we've got a few questions coming up on the Q&A chat but I think we could give you another five minutes just to to wrap up it's it's such good stuff Sarah on, I, I gotta get dung beetles in somewhere. Yeah, I almost, I almost right. missed them. I want your dung beetles. <laughs> I can't do it even if I do a talk about food, it has to have dung beetles in there. Yeah, you know, Andy always tells me off. Anyway, all right, a couple Please. of minutes. So I think that's kind of talking about the kind of they say sort of florally diverse habitat and the importance of that. But another thing that we we work quite um strongly at a policy level as well. Um and you know, we're, we're say, we very much believe, and I personally very much believe that livestock have a have a place um, as part of farming and conservation future, particularly for conservation future. Um, and many years ago, um, I came up with this crazy idea called Dung Beetles Direct, where we would look at um, showcasing the importance of British dung beetles to farmers um, with the potential of if we felt it was necessary, um, breeding native species of dung beetle um, to sell to farmers to boost their populations. So really quickly, we have um, about 50 species of dung beetle here in Britain that live within dung, tunnel below it, pull dung down into the ground. Um, and by doing that, deliver a huge number of ecosystem services to the farming industry and more widely. So, you know, without dung beetles, dung just sits there on the surface as pastures up to a year or so at certain times of the year. So they're really important creatures. Um, and these are lots of different things that dung beetles do for us. Um, and the ones highlighted in green, so reducing pasture fouling, improving pest fly control, parasite control of, of animals, um, and improving nutrient cycles, um, we, we wanted to put a bit of a, an economic value on to see how much money that would be worth um, to individual farmers, but also to the UK cattle industry. Um, so basically by burying dung, dung acts as a, as a breeding ground for pests and parasites of livestock. So if you can get rid of it by using dung beetles, then you can actually reduce the pests and parasites uh, in your livestock and then reduce the amount of chemicals you have to use to control them as well. So it's a, it's a really interesting system. And we worked out that dung beetles could be saving the UK cattle industry about 367 million pounds each year. Um, we're writing this, oh, 
so important. We're writing this up at the moment for the Welsh cattle and sheep industry as well. Um, and we, we're speaking with Welsh government now about how dung beetles could be protected in new agricultural schemes um, and new agricultural uh, support as well. And there's, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in, in that in Wales. So we've, we're keeping our fingers crossed that, um, that, that it's going to be included in in new agricultural policy and then we wanted to say right what if we try what if we supported farmers to actually look after dung beetles on farm um, the issue is a lot of the chemicals we give to our livestock uh, kill dung beetles so what if we said you, you need to slightly hopefully reduce or slightly change your pattern of chemical use so that you're not killing your dung beetles how much extra could they save you um, and it, it came out as about another sort of 40 million pounds a year to the UK just cattle industry um, so currently dung beetles are saving farmers about 40 quid per cow per year. But then if they slightly change their practice, um, they could save another four quid per cow per year. So this is kind of, again, work we're looking at, which is saying, yes, biodiversity is important inherently, but it also can have an economic value to your farming business. Um, so, so like I say, this is very whistle stop tour of, of, of basically saying how else we can value biodiversity. Um, I hate doing it. I hate putting a monetary value on biodiversity. It's horrible. Um, but but I, I think, you know, when we're talking about businesses and getting governments to make a policy change, then we have to. Um, so so I guess that that brings me back just a very quick whistle stop tour into, like I say, into the value of wildlife as well. Um, really? But finally, you know, this is this is what we could be looking at. With farming for the future if we just carry on intensifying and I think none of us want that you know no one does farmers conservationists people who are you know food consumers we don't want that what we want is a sustainable food system and to do that we have to put our money where our mouths are um you know we, we have to be purchasing sustainable food we have to be supporting local farmers um and we have to be prepared to change um, and, and, you know, and this is why we're working now with schools. We've got a teaching resource that's just gone out to our first schools to say to, to young people that, you know, you can make a change with every purchase you make, every bit of food you eat, you can support the type of farming that you want to feed our growing population. Um, so I think I'm going to leave that there and, and hopefully that will then lead on to a few questions. Brilliant. Sarah, that was absolutely terrific. We've got 60 people watching this uh, on Facebook and at the webinar. So there's a lot of interest. Um, we look at the questions uh, in a moment, and I've already had a quick look. Um, many of them are sort of slanted at how do we get farmers to transition? I mean, we're locked into cheap food. We're locked into milk, which costs nothing compared with the the economic and the, the real costs of producing it and produce uh, consumers don't seem to want to pay more for food in Pembrokeshire the, the issues about slurry on land you know it, 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 uh, it, it's it's a it's a problem which the Welsh government is 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 tackling you know how do we get people farmers to transition and farmers are only responding to their economic imperatives after all we shouldn't blame the farmers but it's a big mountain to climb. Um, you know, what, what's the way? Is, is it simply education? Can, can, we, can we speed this up in any way? Otherwise, it's going to be too late. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's the, the issue, isn't it? And I, I think education is absolutely you know, paramount. That's, that's num number one point is what we need to be doing now at every level whether it's in schools and you know, even agricultural colleges um, are, are teaching about intensif intensification. It's, it's you know, how much is your neighbor producing or we'll make sure that you know, you're not seen to have any weeds in your ryegrass pastures, otherwise you know, you're gonna be seen as a bad farmer. And I think that stems back from, uh, from quite a lot of what is taught in agricultural colleges. Um, at, and you, know, you go back to, so for example, chemical use on farms as well. Um, if you are registered as a suitably qualified person, um, you're able to sell veterinary medicines to farmers. And um, so you have to go through some training to be able to sell those, for example. At the moment, that training doesn't involve any discussion about the impact on the environment. So it's things like that. If we can train our vets, train our suitably qualified persons, uh, train, put in that training at an agricultural college level, so that that filters through so that everybody is taking into the account the environment at every every level i think that is vital um but we need government support and because i think that's the thing is, is it, it's all very well like you say 
farmers get a hell of a bashing um and it, it, it's very very unfair because they're like you say they're responding to a market and you know their margins are minuscule and most farmers are now reliant pretty much entirely on farming subsidies if you whipped out the farming subsidies the government support that's provided they would not be viable businesses and i think that's what you know there's been this push for intensification so the inputs are going in are, are getting more and more expensive um yes there is there is an increase in in outputs as a result of that but not a sustainable one like say if you whipped out the subsidies no one would be able to survive the way we farm so we need to change the way that our farming is supported um and we've got the opportunity you know it's it's, it's a, a, a rubbish time at the moment for many reasons um but if we can look at that and pull out the opportunity to say right we, we can change the way our farmers are supported and support more sustainable food production um then you know we've got to do that welsh government needs to step up to the mark the uk government needs to step up to the mark um and then you know as farmers as well we need to step up to the mark you know we we also as farmers need to take this on ourselves as well and not just wait for changes in government policy you know we a lot of big farmers now are not able to produce what they they had once produced because you know for example take oilseed rape well there's you know oilseed rape it, it, it's very dependent on certain pesticides that we know have a detrimental impact to wildlife should we be still looking at constantly sowing oilseed rape each year um when we know that there's a potential we may have to put on a really nasty pesticide um but, but you're saying really there has to be a political initiative the subsidies have to be redirected they have to be more focused on uh, on sustainable farming is that the way yeah absolutely because we won't have soils to grow food in all our parasites and pests will be resistant to the chemicals we have we'll have soils that are barren um and you know in 10 20 years we we our, our yields are just going to plummet um, and then i think another the final point to say is that i think as consumers we need a bit of help we need better stamps on our food to say that this is sustainable you know we've got the organic stamp freedom food stamp uh, conservation grace but they're all a little bit are they difficult aren't they to understand yes when you need a big stamp saying this is supporting sustainable agriculture okay there's a few let's deal with the q a's people have taken the trouble to post um uh uh anonymous is asking uh are cows this perhaps this is andy <laughs> are cows the best choice for grazing if they emit methane would smaller native species be better um so it depends very much on what the animals are eating as to how much um how much methane and other greenhouse gases that they produce um so if you it, it, it so that that kind of from is one point with with cows if you're pumping them full of grain um then that's that they have much kind of more more impact on on the environment um i would say as conservation grazers ruminants are really really important because of the way that they uh graze themselves the way that they don't kind of i mean sheep for example will specifically go i mean they are ruminants obviously but they will go and graze wildflowers at the crowns and they'll kill them so sheep are generally not particularly helpful conservation grazers um whereas cows will just blanket graze a little bit more and therefore deliver better conservation and they're also big bodies so they poach the land as well which you want a little bit of to to, to create habitats ponies can be can be good the issue, I guess, for conservation grazing with ponies is the economics. Um, is the National Trust uh, uses ponies on the coast path, doesn't it? Which, which I was uh, surprised and pleased to, to to learn. They've done that for many years. Yeah, I mean, ponies, I'd say, generally aren't as good conservation grazers as cattle, and um, they don't deliver quite as well. Um, so, you know, National Trust is really looking for for uh, grazing sites with cattle where possible. Um, you don't have the biosecurity issues of ponies but yeah it is a matter of well who pays to look after those ponies and you know the national trust will pay to look after but we quantified it how much money would it actually cost us to have a little herd of conservation grazing ponies because you if you don't have an output from that um and it wasn't viable um we have a small herd of conservation grazing ponies as our pets and so that that works but economically it's a difficult one to scale up yeah okay and a sort of detailed one here which is a bit of a sales pitch for you um can we buy the Vexo bolognese sauce now? <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
you can at the moment buy it in Grub Kitchen, so you can eat it in house in Grub Kitchen when we're open. Um, and we are in the process of um, of actually getting Vexo packaged up. It'll be a frozen product, so it's got a long shelf life um, from a sustainability point of view and sold in farm shops. Um, we're not quite there yet, but watch this space. And if you are interested, just drop us an email um, and we can add you to the waiting list. Brilliant. Sarah, it's been absolutely exhilarating listening to you. And one of the mantras of the Ideas Festival is that ideas lead to action. And you're a shining example of having a brilliant idea and putting it into action. And that's spun off into lots of other different uh, paths. Really delighted that you've been able to join us. Thank you so much for your presentation. I hope you can come to our real live festival next year when we can continue this, um, this wonderful story. I mean, one of the takeaways for me is that we're already eating insects. So, you know, we, we've crossed the threshold anyway. Brilliant, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for our big audience today. I hope you've all been inspired by Sarah. Go out, look for some insects to eat and some dung beetles to nurture. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. Next session, of course, will be... Um, next session is Mental Health in Rural Communities. Uh, the Dean is leading that discussion at two o'clock. So please um, jump onto that one. Um, uh, there's a lunch break now. And once again, uh, I don't want to be a pain, but if you go to our website, you can press that donate button and sling us a few quid so that we can get this festival up and running again next year when we can all speak to each other and shake hands perhaps. All the very best. Thank you so much. Goodbye. See you this afternoon. Real. Oh, thank, terrific thank, stuff. Thank you, Sarah. That was fantastic. Yes. Really, really, really great. Really, really great. Can't seem to get the thing up anyway. Yeah. yeah you have your face, Patrick. Which yeah, have I got a bit a, of face? Might be an advantage, actually. But. Yeah, well, thank you very much. <laughs> no, that was really outstanding. Thank you so much. Yeah, right, I'm going to close this down. And uh, so, Sarah, you're you're not a you're not a veggie yourself. Uh, I am predominantly a, a predominantly plant based diet. So I don't. I try not to put a stamp on it. But um, yeah, I I generally yeah, me eat too, me plant. too. But uh, some of my best friends, my farmer, are farmers, and I'm married to a, a carnivore. So I'm very uh, I'm very relaxed. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I was swimming in the harbour oh, this okay. morning, and you can smell the slurry in the water. You know, and, and the, the water in the harbour is of questionable quality after, after... Don't you know, swim. Swim rain. at White Sands, Ivor. Don't swim at the harbour. No, I know, I know. The <laughs> only time I swam in the harbour last year, I had a terrible stomach upset. Yeah. Don't overstate it. I mean, I swim, no, <laughs> I swim in it every day. So, I know you do. You're crazy, uh, man. It's, it's, uh, it's, but, oh, you know, the, the slurry. Now, how can the poor dung beetles work when, when the whole surface has been covered in slurry? They don't. It kills them. Yeah. And, uh, well, it, uh, they don't go to slurry anyway. You know, they'll just go to fresh dung. But if the slurry coats the you soil know. and provides that impenetrable barrier and stops oxygen going into the soil, then, then the, any larvae underground, yeah, don't fare too well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Your black cows look lovely, man. <laughs> Oh, they're the best. Yeah, they're absolutely great in there. Their dung is full of dung beetles as well. Oh, it's great. It's great. It's great to see, uh, you know, it's all coming to fruition for you, you know. What's the next sort of step for you now then? You've got your research going and... Yeah, so I think I think the big thing is this this real total like, shift on the bug farm now that we are primarily a wild, we're a wild...